Well, impact fees are a fairly recent phenomena. And actually, I, over my time on the council, I have come to understand that impact fees don't do what they're supposed to do according to the propaganda. I'm actually opposed to impact fees for a couple of different reasons. Reason number one is they don't do what they're supposed to do or what the propaganda says they're supposed to do. And then reason number two is that it actually encourages wasteful spending by the jurisdiction. For those reasons, I'm mainly against impact fees. Uh, there are a couple of intermediate steps between having an impact fee system that we have right now and getting rid of the impact fee system. One thing that we should be doing is deferring the impact fees at the very least until the time of occupancy, the time of um, buying of the property, if you will, by the final user. That's a first good step. But the second thing is we really need to look at getting rid of the impact fees because the community as a whole needs to uh, evaluate whether or not it has the infrastructure ready and willing and able to support all the businesses that it has or wants to attract. And when it comes to new people or new businesses coming into the community, it's really not an us versus them situation. We have to ask as a community, are we ready to accept these new people? Do we want this growth? And if we do, impact fees are a barrier to that. Well, first off, we have to take a look at the core function of government. The core function of government is to protect life, liberty, and property. That's pretty much it. And so when government goes beyond that realm of protecting life, liberty, and property, it does so at the expense of liberty. And I think that it's one of the biggest problems we have with this tax discussion is that we all want taxes to be low. We have to also pay for the services that the city should be doing. Whenever there is a tax that is for something that the city should not be doing or the county should not be doing, and the entertainment tax is a good example of that, it's not their business to promote or make winners and losers in the entertainment business. So when you have a specific tax for that purpose, I'm very much opposed to it. There are many other attendant issues that are, that are wrong about that entertainment tax, and I'm opposed to it that way as well. Now, if our county wants to have a ballpark, great. I hope some investors, some private money can come in, build a ballpark, make it profitable. But if we have to tax people in order for that to exist, I think that's wrong. As far as taxes overall are concerned, we always have to find a balance. Um, I want taxes to be lower than what they are right now. I think that when taxes are lower, you tend to have more tax revenue. That's the Laffer curve, if you will because they, more people are encouraged to buy those goods and services. There is a point where there are diminishing returns, but I don't think we're there yet. Certainly, the biggest problem we have right now is we're being um, squeezed on all different sides with increasing costs. The solution isn't just raising taxes. The solution is taking a look at those costs and seeing whether they should be eliminated or reduced or whether or not the services that we're providing as a city fall in line with does it protect life, liberty, and property. If it falls outside of that scope, I suggest that we consider reducing it or eliminating it. I think as far as um, light rail is concerned. It is, I think if we take a look at the people who have dealt with it in Portland across the river, uh, there's many different views. Many people like the convenience of it. That's certainly a good thing. However, uh, many people also argue that it promotes a lot of crime. And one of the, one of the most low-level crimes that it actually promotes is because the, the platforms themselves are not restricted, in other words, you don't have to have a ticket to get on the platform, it promotes a lot of fraud in people not buying a ticket to get on the uh, light rail, which is just sort of a gateway to people disregarding uh, the importance of following the law on that system. As far as the bus rapid transit system is concerned, I think any time a city takes dedicated lanes, um, or should I say traffic lanes, and then takes them away from their normal use and then changes that to a dedicated lane for bus rapid transit, it's going to be a uh, difficult adjustment period. 
the community has to evaluate whether or not they really want this service or not and what the long-term cost is going to be. One of the most difficult aspects of this cost with the Clark County system right now is going to be whether or not the funding is going to come from a smaller district and whether or not the, it's going to be gerrymandered in such a way that it guarantees a vote in the right direction. And if so, my prediction is that the actual total cost in the future will come from the entire system subsidizing it and not just from that gerrymandered district. So that would be an abuse of this system and I don't support that. Washougal is a little far out from the bus rapid transit system and so we're not directly affected by that except my city would very likely be subsidizing through our normal taxes the bus rapid transit system that my own constituents would not necessarily be using, or at least not on the, the scale that you would expect if you're going to be paying for this system. For all of those reasons, I'm actually against the, the um, proposed improvements for bus, bus rapid transit and light rail. Well, with regards to the, um, the green hybrid option, I think this is an example of how uh, politics has entered into something that the city really shouldn't be involved in, and that is trying to promote an agenda. I believe that agenda is, guided, or is misguided by um, questionable uh, science, questionable goals, and questionable outcomes. I think once we start going down that road of subsidizing heavily one option, we Yes, we can do these things. We can have a hybrid, we can have an electric powered um, vehicle. There's no problem for doing these things, but it's very expensive. Will you get your return on investment? No. Will you feel good about it? I'm sure politicians certainly will, leaders certainly will, but will the average citizen feel happy about the fact that his tax dollars are being subsidized for something that may or may not really help them in, in the uh, final run? So I'm, I'm opposed to those types of interventionist systems. Anytime you look at an alternative fuel and an alternative um, a green option, if you will, you have to look at the total cost, what's, who's subsidizing it, and whether it really will give you a return on investment or whether it's just um, a return on your portion of the investment. And I think once we do that as a society, uh, we're going to have a better understanding of what's going on. With regards to the tax and uh, CTRAN and their business structure, from the little that I've seen from their business statements and from how they're pursuing their business, I think they are running themselves towards a crisis and that's part of their plan is that if you have a crisis, people are more likely to support tax increases. I think it would be better to match your level of service with how much revenue you have coming in, even if you know, that doesn't follow what your projections were three years ago or four years ago or however long it's been since your last tax increase. So if you match your revenue, or should I say match your services with your revenue coming in now, that's a better model than running at full tilt, even if it's not producing money, and then asking for a tax increase once there's a crisis. No, I do not support building light rail in Clark County. I mean, certainly I've enjoyed using light rail in many different cities that I've flown to and, and visited, and it's a very convenient system. However, I don't think our community is, is ready for light rail, and I, I can completely understand the arguments for why people would want to have it now before uh, our population uh, grows any further. However, right now, we can't afford it we can't afford the infrastructure, and we can't afford the maintenance. It's going to be subsidized, no matter how you look at it. Plus, I or should say light rail is always going to be subsidized. Uh, the fares will never pay for the, the actual cost, which means that a lot of the maintenance costs, a lot of the operating costs are going to be paid for out of tax dollars taken from elsewhere. And that's, that's a huge burden on the system right now. I don't think that that's really wise for us to get involved in. I, 
I, well, as far as uh, supporting uh, growth where it, growth happens, I, I'm of the philosophy that uh, growth will happen wherever it's supposed to be happening. I mean, if a business comes in and they see that they've got a great opportunity, they'll set up shop and they'll do what it takes to uh, uh, set up shop there and hopefully have a customer base that's going to support them. If they're successful, there will be other businesses that prop up or come up around them, and that's I think that's generally a good thing. One of the biggest um, problems we have in government is when government officials and politicians and bureaucrats try to decide where the best growth is going to be, which businesses are best to put in those places. And when politicians start playing uh, favorites and have winners and losers and say, oh, well, we want green companies over here, we want those dirty companies over there, and, and so on and so forth, and if they do that, um, pushing an ideological agenda versus reflecting the needs of the citizens, I think that the citizens will always lose. It'll always be more difficult in those situations for growth to happen the way, or the way it's going to be most successful. Now, as far as a bridge is concerned, I think it may make sense for us to have another bridge. Bridges are incredibly expensive, and that's a big problem. Part of our, our issues with how we build bridges these days is uh, that our standards have risen so many times, I mean, many times over in comparison to what they were when we built some of the earliest bridges. And that's a good thing because they're safer, but now they're a lot more expensive, even if you adjust for inflation dollars. So where we build the bridge, what that bridge is going to look like, um, I can't predict where it's going to be the best place. If it was on 192nd, that'd be great. If it was uh, uh, west of downtown Vancouver, that could be a very good solution. I've heard all of those options. Um, and I would, I would think that if you, if you do have a new bridge corridor, you are going to have another explosion of, uh, of businesses and successful businesses along that corridor. It just makes sense. Where there's access, people will come, they'll buy services and goods, and they'll want to live close to that uh, easy access. The more access points we have across the river, the easier it's going to be uh, for people to live where they want to within the county instead of being forced to live near a, a dense center. And that's completely up to uh, the individual citizen. As far as sprawl is concerned, I once heard a professor talk about this. He says, if, if money was no option and you could live anywhere you want to, the average person would say, well, I want to live way out in the country where there's nobody around and I don't have to live within earshot of my neighbor. That would be the ideal thing. Okay, what if money is slightly an object then? Well, I'd live in the suburbs, but not really in the center of the town. And, and so on and so forth. There's this great, or this, this scale, if you will, where uh, depending on how much money people have, very likely they'll live in different places because a lot of people put a high price on that solitude, living in the country and whatnot. And I think it is a mistake for politicians to assume that that's always a bad thing. Now, it's a mistake to assume that it's always a good thing as well. There, I mean, there's a lot of balancing act to be had there, but right now the current assumption in most polit political circles is that it's always a bad thing to live out in the country by yourself. And I don't, I don't support that. I think people should live or enjoy their property uh, wherever they find the property that suits their needs. Well, ideally, what we'd do is we'd build up the cash reserves first, spend the money uh, cash in hand, or uh, buy a loan that's very low interest loan. However, one of the most common methods of financing city operations, unfortunately, is floating bonds. And that's basically uh, asking our citizens to be obligated for 20, 30, 40 years for a project that we get right now. Well, 40 years from now, that project may be near its life expectancy. Uh, it may be completely, it's very likely going to be completely forgotten, but we're still going to be paying it off at that point. It's far better for us overall, and we'd save more money if we built up the reserves first and then spent it. There is a challenge with that, and I will recognize that challenge. And that challenge is that as soon as you build up a certain number of, of X number of dollars for reserves, there will be a politician who runs for office who says they've got X number of dollars in reserve and they're not using it, don't you want this goodie over here, instead of what that money was originally dedicated for. And that's one of the biggest challenges with raising the money first because you can't earmark that money unless it's for something like a public works trust fund or the water uh, enterprise or sewer enterprise. For those you can, 
but even still, it, the dollars would have to be dedicated to items within that trust fund. So overall, it's a, it's a delicate balancing act. I think how cities are, are balancing that right now depends, of course, on the jurisdiction. In Washougal, so far we've been very fortunate that we've been able to uh, balance our budget and not do extraordinary measures uh, yet. But there are many pressures which are coming up against the city in the near future which are going to, um, unfortunately, make us change either the services that we provide or the tax structure that we have because of some of the embedded cost uh, of just having employees and having the, the health care expense which is going up. These cost drivers are going to have to be met with either less services, higher taxes, or something else that we're not quite seeing. And a lot of that is driven um, at the level that's beyond the city. And we're simply just balancing it the best we can within the city. My job is to try to balance those issues as best as possible, provide financial stewardship, and to be as fiscally responsible as possible to the citizens. Well, in my time on the council uh, since June of 2007, I'm sorry, June 2009, uh, I have advocated for fiscal responsibility, for protecting life, liberty, and property, and for re reviewing whether or not something is uh, fits with the core function of government. I am asking for the voters to please vote for me in order to be able to continue that project of fiscal responsibility, open and transparent government, and doing things like having the city budget on the website and other than just a PDF form so that the people can see the graph form, so they can see where their tax dollars are going. And one of the things that I've consistently been doing on the council has been voting in a way that is consistent with protecting life, liberty, and property. That's the core function of government. That's what we must uh, keep reminding ourselves of because even though all, all these other really cool projects are really fun and, and neat to look at, if it doesn't protect life, liberty, and property, it's beyond the scope of what government should be doing. And so that for all of that, I'm asking for everybody's vote. And also, they can go to my website, michaeldelivar.com. On there, I also list my votes, so you can see how I voted, what the issue is, and which way, it, whether it passed or whether it didn't pass. And that's my way of illustrating what transparent government can look like.